Communications function at the bottom. So uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Emily. I am the National Coordinator of Canada Without Poverty, um, and we are a Dignity for All co-lead. Uh, we have been one of the co-leads since the beginning, along with Citizens for Public Justice. Um, so we are very excited to welcome everyone to Chew on This 2021. Uh, I will just kick things off with a land acknowledgement. Now, land acknowledgements on Zoom are always something I find very unique, but also an opportunity for us to reflect on not only the land that we are currently on, but the lands that we are um, Oh, you know, have been on as we've traveled across this country, the lands that other people who are joining in today are on. And, you know, knowing that human beings have always moved across these lands and the First Nations people have, you know, lived and traded and traveled across these lands. So uh, CWP and CPJ are situated on the unceded land of the Algonquin Nation in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, unceded means that there was never a formal treaty um, and that there was never really any justice in, in the settlement of, of Ottawa, um, where the Parliament Hill, Hill is, and that's something I often think about. Um, and in Ottawa, there's um, the biggest out of the North population of the Inuit people. So I often think of that and how, you know, the Inuit people have made homes in, in Ottawa as well. So just thinking about transition and sort of the holistic nature of, of humans and traveling and interconnectedness. Okay, I will leave it at that. And I will jump into our agenda to get things going. So our agenda today, um, Natalie, do you want to just switch the slide? Perfect, thank you. Um, <laughs> teamwork. The agenda today, we'll be going over our key message this year. So why we've chosen this key message and, uh, and the what of this key message. We'll be talking about our pledge, which many of you have probably gotten a chance to look over. We're going to be diving into the how and when of our pledge. So specifically why we've chosen certain topics, um, you know, the policies on to how to achieve these, these pledge points and um, our timelines. Then we will talk about engaging MPs and we have a party by party breakdown just so that you can situate uh, our advice sort of in your constituency and with your contacts. Um, and then we'll have some resources that we'll point you to, to for engaging your local media to, to increase some public awareness about the Chew on this campaign and hopefully increase engagement for, for the 2021 year. It's, um, it's a year of virtual um, engagement again, so it's always different. Um, so hopefully we can increase and uh, get some motivation going in your constituencies and your writings. Okay, so hopping into the key message. So um, as many of you know, in 2019, the government of Canada through their first poverty reduction strategy committed to reducing poverty by 50% by 2030. Um, and uh, one real message we have this year is who will be left behind. Now there is some indications of, of targets, including gender diverse peoples, including women in, in some of these targets, but there really has not been a, enough attention paid to those in poverty who are most vulnerable to the systemic and um, institutionalized racisms and colonialisms and systems that cause marginalized communities um, such as First Nations, uh, Métis, Inuit, women, uh, queer communities, gender diverse communities, senior singles, children, youth transitioning out of care, um, people ex with disabilities, people with precarious status, time and time again and every year we see poverty um, for these groups being experienced at higher rates for white cisgendered heterosexual Canadians and we really want to focus on these populations and to effectively and equitably deal with poverty we need to specific targets and timelines for people who are most often left behind which are these equity seeking groups that I just named previously so that's our key message this year is you know if we're going to be only reducing poverty by 50% by 2030, well, who will be left behind? And how are we going to ensure that the path to poverty reduction is equitable? I'll, um, so I'll pass it off to you, Natalie.
sorry, everyone, I couldn't get to my mute button while I was sharing my screen. So I'm just going to start that up again. All right. Make sure we're in the right spot here. Okay, so uh, again, welcome. My name is Natalie Appleyard. Um, I'm the socioeconomic policy analyst at Citizens for Public Justice. Um, great to see many familiar faces and names and uh, thanks for your continued support. Uh, so I'm just gonna go over a little bit of the targets and timelines in our, our pledge and some of the framing of um, how we came to these targets. I wanna thank all the organizers who have engaged with us and helped provide input and feedback on, on developing our asks and our messaging. And uh, I hope that you'll find that these are resonating with you and your communities where you're going to be engaging with your MPs. So um, the pledge that we've come up with uh, has, as you know, six different targets and timelines, six different areas. And we have tried to strike a balance between coming up with targets that are ambitious and reflect the urgency of the situation that uh, recognize that poverty is a violation of people's basic rights and dignity. So we, we want urgent and ambitious action, but we also feel that these targets are attainable. So whereas a lack of political will might make some of these targets improbable, we believe that they are all still very possible. And that's a key point that we want to express to MPs when we're meeting with them, that just because it is unlikely that we might reach some of these targets. Um, it's not because they're not possible, it's because there is a lack of sufficient political will to get them done. And so we have um, proposed these targets and timelines uh, specifically for marginalized groups and equity seeking groups to recognize how uh, these folks are certainly uh, disproportionately impacted by poverty, as Emily has said. And so um, we've drawn these targets from various reports and, um, and recommendations from a number of partner organizations. So um, we're, we're grateful for, for those uh, folks and, and all the work that they do. Um, so we, again, we've developed these targets and timelines, but um, notably we have not been very prescriptive in terms of how to achieve those targets and timelines. And so one of the key points that we want to make is that um, what we're looking for from the federal government are these targets and timelines, the kind of funding to make sure that these things can be, um, can be possible, um, to make sure that there are minimum standards, but that the pathways must be developed in consultation with the communities most affected. So for example, while we have used these targets and timelines in the pledge, figuring out how to do these things must be developed in consultation with Indigenous-led uh, organizations and, and, and um, First Nations, Inuit and Métis governments, uh, with Black communities, with queer communities, with disabled people and communities. Um, so again, these are the targets and timelines that we're aiming for um, to honor people's uh, human rights and ensure that people are living with dignity, but there are many different pathways to get there and they can be localized while still having these same national standards and targets. Uh, the preamble of the pledge recognizes systemic oppression. And so that may be a jump for some candidates, but we feel like we've made the case that uh, I don't think too many people will argue with the fact that poverty disproportionately affects certain groups. So while all people can be affected by poverty, and certainly we've seen with the pandemic, how more and more people have felt that, uh, that threat of poverty and precarity. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think too many people would, would say that it's not true that certain groups are um, disproportionately impacted by poverty. And so um, we do ask MPs, and senators to recognize systemic oppression in the preamble. And we ask them to commit to working with others to realize these targets and timelines, uh, to support adequate investments, and to develop plans with, uh, with members from other parties and with, um, and with, again, the communities that are most impacted by these things.
So that brings us into our pledge point. So our first point is ensure sustainable access to safe drinking water by 2023 and to adequate culturally appropriate nutritious food in the territories and on reserves by 2025. Eliminate food insecurity for all by 2030. So some backgrounder is we are specifying safe drinking water because the issue of safe drinking water goes far beyond just the boil water advisories. It's a complicated issue, but unfortunately there hasn't been a lot of transparency around um, how the government uh, ensures safe drinking water because boil water advisories, while, um, while uh, rem remedying them is a positive change in the community, it's not necessarily a guarantee that that ex reserve or that community will um, never experience a boil water advisory again. We've seen um, reserves you know, highlighting that perhaps they've had a boil water advisory lifted in their community, but six months to a year later, they are seeing, you know, um, periods where they are um, experiencing a boil water advisory again. And, um, and it is, it's an issue that's complicated and um, will only be addressed by commitments that ensure that this will be a sustainable and effective issue and not just about lifting a boil water advisory for a few months. One of the important ways to achieve this is through the consultation with First Nations reserves. Every reserve is experiencing um, safe drinking water um, issues for different reasons. Some it's outdated infrastructure and others it's it's lack of capacity and uh, resources to train um, residents in order to maintain these infrastructure um, water filtration systems. So every single reserve needs to be addressed individually. Consultation needs to be done with that community to understand their needs and capacity. And we need to continue seeing that. And we are, um, you know, hoping for a very near future timeline of 2023 as, um, you know, we've already extended the deadline for that the Liberal government had promised. Um, and then access to adequately appropriate nutritious food, you know, this is, uh, you know, food that just, that isn't just the basic necessities, but food that is nutritious, is culturally appropriate, making sure that people have access to options, and eliminating food insecurity for all by 2030. Food insecurity is, out of all the sort of intersecting issues of poverty, has been one of the, um, one of the things that have, has increased since the start of the pandemic severely, and we're not going to fix it by funding food banks. So we really need to be clear that food insecurity is a holistic issue. It's not just an issue that will be addressed through food banks. And I think all parties would benefit from being reminded about that. Uh, next, we'll look at our pledge point on income security. And maybe just, um, just before I go on, I, I did share this in the chat, but if anyone has questions, that they'd like to pose um, throughout, um, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll keep an eye on that. Um, but our plan is kind of just to take you through the pledge, take you through some talking points with MPs, um, but please feel free to, uh, to ask questions in the chat and we can take them throughout the presentation or we can take uh, any further questions at the end. Uh, so the second point in the pledge is about income security. And so we have asked, um, MPs and senators to commit to establishing a minimum income floor for people living in Canada. And um, we are intentional with our wording here of minimum income floor as um, leaving room for whether that means a, a guaranteed basic income or whether that means other uh, income security measures working together. But again, the, the goal, regardless of the pathway, the goal is to ensure that all people in Canada have at least 60% of the median income of all Canadians by 2025. And um, so that 60% of the median income is also known as the LIM 60. Um, so it's 60% of the low income measure, for example. Um, and again, this, the, the, this is a measure that's used by Campaign 2000 and by UNICEF and it's used internationally, so it's a, a good standard. Um, but I will note that in some cases in Canada right now, whether you look at the market basket measure thresholds or the low income measure thresholds, there are some cases where the, the MBM is actually higher than the LIM 60. So the point of this is adequacy and starting a conversation. So um, Again, we should see this as a, a minimum 
uh, to ensure that people have the income that they need to be able to afford rent uh, or shelter um, for food, for medical needs, all these things. And we've got a pretty tight uh, short timeline on this one uh, of 2025, because what we saw with the CERB, for example, was that when there was sufficient political will, the government was able to act very quickly and get cash to people in a way that um, either prevented or alleviated uh, the stress of, of income insecurity for, for many people. And, uh, and similarly, we saw what a difference that made for people in comparison to the current social assistance levels um, and disability assistance levels. So again, we're calling for this to be a minimum standard and, um, you know, if they want to um, mince words in terms of whether that's the MBM threshold or the LIM60, the point is that we want to make sure that people have enough income to survive. And again, uh, with all these um, points in our pledge, we want to make sure that these are initiatives that are tackled together and in, in tandem with one another, because we know that only looking at income security without addressing housing, for example, or rental prices or rent freezes, or without address, addressing employment, without addressing um, all these other issues, um, we won't be successful. So this is meant to be a holistic approach. Uh, so that's what, um, that's a little bit about some of the nuances of the wording of this one. Uh, so for those who support a basic income, it can go that way. For those who have reservations or concerns about that, um, there's still room for other ways. Uh, Stella, I see that you've raised a hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and invite you to unmute and ask your question. Maybe I need to do that for you. Let me just see here. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry, sorry. It was actually a bit of a mistake. I was trying to find the chat thing or the or a question, but I but I I, I just have to say that. Um, our group that I will be doing this uh, with, or on behalf of, I guess, with other people in the group, um, we we are committed to an MBM. Uh, for and mainly, we're focused on income assistance, and I think that that will be perhaps one of the things we will focus on in our in our uh, chat with Andy Fillmore, who we've seen several times before, um, because this is where many of the lowest income people land up and um, you know when you're talking about 50 percent of the uh, base of the um, MBM as the level of income assistance for an, um, a so-called employable single person it's that's pretty bad you know anyway yeah let's just to say that's what we're going to do thanks Stella and um, yeah that's that's helpful to um, to know again uh, with this campaign, we're, we're trying to provide flexibility for, for local organizers who um, particularly who have really active uh, expertise in, in specific areas. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the point being um, adequacy, which again, I totally agree, 60% of the low income measure or 50% or of the MBM, like that's a pretty low bar. Um, but if we can use that as... Uh, no, no, it again, has the, to be up to the MBM. I mean, that's what's required to live. That's what, that, right. you know, the MBM is basically a, a basic income, uh, you know, and I have to focus, focus on income assistance because the income assistance systems across this country are dreadful. Mm -hmm. um, and unless, you know, we can ask the federal government to do this, that and the other, but, you know, then the people who are on income assistance, it's the province's bailiwick. But the, the federal government can do something through um, standards, requirements, uh, uh, and so on, and, and providing mm -hmm. more money to the provinces for it. So just wanted yeah, to absolutely. raise that because it's not all a federal issue, right? Yes, anyway. absolutely. And, and again, thanks for, for making that point, Stella. Um, so again, what we're, we're not trying to prescribe the, the pathways. Um, so again, um, looking at sort of what federal minimum standards, what federal investments can be made 
to allow various provinces to come up with effective strategies, for example, could be one way to go about this. Uh, and I'm going to pass things back over to Emily. Housing. Okay, so this is it was definitely one of the biggest issues of the election. Uh, we saw for the first time all parties come up with um, come out with very comprehensive housing plans or strategies. Um, that being said, nothing really pushed the envelope far enough to address the just like extreme housing crisis we are dealing with, and it's getting worse every day. Um, so there is still a lack of attention to um, and, and detail to deeply affordable rental units. This was something that was really missed in the election, um, and it's something that we want to uh, highlight with our um, need to eliminate core housing need and homelessness by 2030, tracking data to ensure equitable progress along the way, and close the gap in funding for rural versus, uh, um, sorry, rural, excuse let me just restart that sentence. Close the gap in funding for rural versus urban housing and homelessness immediately. Um, so, you know, especially if you're dealing with a Liberal MP, they might highlight that, you know, the Liberal Party has invested billions of dollars into housing. And while that's a great common ground to start off with, and, you know, that's a great Thing to commend them for. A lot of the, these policies, such as reaching home, didn't quite reach these equity seeking groups. So, for example, some smaller Indigenous led communities were denied funding for their reaching home. Uh, reaching home program um, and they were left without any sort of action or um, help to remediate that the housing need in their communities. Um, and um, and in some provinces, there's a, a huge not only urban homelessness and housing crisis, but rural housing crisis. I know in the in the Saskatchewan, uh, Manitoba, Alberta, Quebec, there's a lot of rural housing need, um, and it needs to be taken as seriously as the urban housing need is. Um, so here, you know, it's a big investment. Uh, you know, these, uh, I think a lot of MPs are going to talk about how expensive it is and how lengthy it is. But again, you know, where there is public will, there is political will. And the longer that we, um, the longer that we take to address these issues, the more expensive it's going to get. Um, and, you know, by housing first initiatives and uh, addressing housing need, you are in the long run addressing a lot of the other costs that are associated with poverty and lack of housing, such as healthcare and, uh, you know, the need for social assistance and other employment programs. So you can really just highlight that housing is one of the fundamental ways to um, address these needs and issues of poverty first, not, not to say it is a, by any means going to solve everything. Um, but by not um, addressing it, it's just going to make the problem worse overall. Um, and I will pass it off to Natalie for the fourth point. Thanks, Emily. Um, so the, the next point is about health and unmet medical needs due to financial constraints. Um, so reports show, for example, that um, many, many people in, in this country can't afford, whether it's the medicine they need, whether it's assistive devices uh, or mobility devices, whether it's mental health supports, um, physiotherapy. Um, so many people are not getting the health care that they need, uh, including mental health, um, because of financial constraints. So we're calling for an expansion of the public health care system to include in community, so meaning that people should be able to access this where they live, which is particularly uh, critical for people living on reserve and um, for Jordan's principle, which um, guarantees that uh, people should be able to receive the medical care they need without having to wait for the uh, provincial and federal governments to argue over who's going to pay for it. Um, it means that uh, healthcare needs to be culturally appropriate. So we've heard throughout the pandemic and and long before uh, many, uh, many people's experiences with the healthcare system being um, um, uh, racist and colonial. And so we need that culturally appropriate care, both again, in terms of um, our physical health, but also our mental health and, uh, and cultural care. And, um, and so, so again, we, we want, are calling for both of those principles in uh, publicly funded systems of pharma care, mental health, dental, vision, and physiotherapy, 
And we have put by 2025 here, um, partly because they've been talking for ages about um, implementing pharmacare now. And so uh, we just want to make sure that this, uh, this actually gets done, that we uh, move forward from consultations and, and actually put it into practice. Um, and again, recognizing that some of these, um, some of this access to, to healthcare is a matter of income. And so again, by addressing income security, we can also improve people's health uh, by making sure people have nutritious food, we can improve health, uh, making sure people have housing, we can improve health. So there are, again, many different pathways to achieve these goals, but we do believe that um, you know, every part of our body and soul and spirit <laughs> should be cared for in terms of our health systems. And so that's why we've called for a pretty ambitious target uh, regarding health uh, in Canada. So early childhood education and child care. So we are calling to ensure all families can access affordable, flexible, accessible, publicly funded, and culturally appropriate early learning education and child care, investing in the creation of additional subsidized spaces and fair compensation for staff by 2025. So the $10 a day daycare initiative was an important first step. We also want to highlight that $10 a day is still quite unaffordable for many people. That translates to nearly $200 a month, if not more. Um, and that is still going to be out of reach for, for many. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a PC um, MP, a progressive conservative MP, you know, they do have a plan that involves a tax benefit. However, it's not addressing the fact that there is just a lack of uh, subsidized spaces and a lack of childhood um, care spaces. People are competing for, for uh, accessible and affordable child care in their neighborhood. And, you know, um, it, it's, a, it's an urgent need that needs to be addressed, as well as the compensation for staff by 2025. Now, you know, not only is access to child care something that those marginalized and equity seeking groups experience more than anyone else, but also the staff of those um, of, of child care spaces. It's a very undervalued and underappreciated and underpaid sector of employment, often staffed by people who are racialized or recent immigrants, um, who are women or gender diverse peoples, uh, who are young or seniors, and we need to uh, ensure that child care is um, you know, not only helping the child, not only helping the parent, but a child care system that helps the staff of that very system. Um, and I think that is all. Yes, so those are all our pledges, the six main points. One more. <laughs> oh, sorry, my bad, my bad. I apologize. No everyone. problem. Uh, so our last one has to do with employment and pay equity. Um, I don't have a whole lot to share uh, on this one. If you'd like further information, I recommend that you check out the work that Color of Poverty, Color of Change is doing on pay equity. Um, but again, it's well established that there are huge gaps, both in terms of access to employment and employment rates, um, depending on um, many different features of, of people's social identities. And um, so whether you're looking within genders, whether you're looking within ethnicities, uh, there are these uh, intersectional gaps in employment rates and pay equity. And so we are calling again for, um, for federal standards and investments to, um, to close these gaps by 2030. Uh, this is one where there are many, many, many different pathways that this could be, um, this could be explored. So whether you're looking at education or um, untying uh, restrictions based on immigration status, for example, um, looking at um, pay grades in federally, um, in federal sectors. Uh, so again, calling, wanting to name this as a, as a barrier for people uh, in terms of their socioeconomic outcomes, um, but recognizing that, um, again, the role of the federal government in this is really to implement standards and investments um, for uh, more local solutions to be developed. Uh, so that one is the last pledge point. Um, and so uh, next we're gonna, um, I, actually, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna um, ask if, um, if there are any questions, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen here. Are there any 
questions that folks want to ask in the chat or any comments that people would like to make just on the pledge points before we go on to talking a little bit about engaging with MPs. And I don't see any hands, but of course, uh, do feel free to, to ask anything. Oh, there we go. Um, Stella, go ahead. Oh, I'm unmuted. Am I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's nothing about seniors here, and I wondered, uh, you know, the cost of uh, long-term care is an issue for seniors for sure. Um, I know that you know it's partially covered, I guess, in income security and some of the health uh, things, uh, except uh, long-term care isn't included in that. Um, you know, that's been a big issue in the last uh, two years during the pandemic and um, it's consistently an issue. So I, 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 you know, despite the fact that there's long-term care, you, you know, you have to pay for certain things. Most of it's private, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm just wondering whether you've given any thought to that. Thanks, Tala. Yeah, great point. Um, I think, again, um, now that uh, the pledge has been finalized and, and published, I'd invite people to make sure that they are raising that point in those meetings. <laughs> and uh, that's something that we can certainly do in our own lobbying efforts. Um, so absolutely, I, I see it integrated in, into the health and income security and housing, of course. Um, so yes, please do keep um, mentioning th that specifically as, as well in your meetings. Uh, thanks, Stella. Uh, Darlene? Hi, everyone. Um, and uh, maybe my question is more about it's really more about process and and maybe more about engaging MPs and senators. Um, uh, but I, I like the campaign and I think it's a really good focus. Um, I, I wonder myself about um, continuity with with previous two on this campaigns because a lot of the years prior were focused on um, a federal uh, anti-poverty plan. Um, we have a poverty reduction strategy legislated and we have a right to housing legislated and we have the UNDRP legislated. Um, so I wouldn't want to let anyone off the hook <laughs> in terms of, of what's the plan for implementation. Um, and I think this help, this is, this can be a part of that, but but I wanted to like when we go to our MP, we've already raised this issue with him. Um, I hope he'll sign on. Um, but yeah, is there a way we can kind of have some talking points with that continuity for uh, previous campaigns? Sure, that's a great point, Darlene. And I think um, you know our our kind of launching point was uh, okay. So you delivered on this. Uh, poverty reduction strategy that Dignity for All has called for for years. Um, that's great, but you know we still have this target of 50% and we don't have any clarity on really the path to get there or the path to eradication uh, or the path to, to make sure that this progress is effective and equitable. And so we've kind of, um, we're seeing this as almost like a second, a second phase um, from our initial ask of developing a, a national poverty reduction strategy. So um, it would be great to make that connection since a lot of MPs will be familiar with, with the campaign and with you as organizers. So I think we can make the case that we're trying to build on the momentum, uh, but recognizing again that, um, uh, as you've said, Darlene, that there's, there's been some really important legislation passed but there's still a ways to go to make sure that our impact is truly effective and equitable. And so the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is absolutely a, a huge piece of that in developing uh, an implementation plan. And again, 
maybe hearkening back to this idea that all these solutions, all the pathways to achieving these targets have to be developed in consultation um, with, with those that are most directly impacted. And, uh, and similarly, you know, when we talk about the housing legislation, um, you we could point out that we're still waiting for a housing advocate to be named to investigate these systemic claims. Um, so again, while there has been some really important first steps taken. We want to continue to demand accountability um, and, and ensure that our progress is moving forward in a way that is equitable and actually addressing some of these underlying causes rather than just being satisfied to look at the, the levels of income and say, great, we've lifted people out of poverty who were maybe just hovering around the poverty line, right? So um, I know that StatsCan is also collecting data on depth of poverty and how many people are entering or exiting poverty. So th this is all really critical information for us to have, um, but there remains just a paucity of, of disaggregated data to, um, to really track progress, <clears throat> excuse me, on certain indicators among, um, among uh, historically marginalized communities. And, um, and so even you know, where there are data gaps, there are certainly enough people with lived experience talking about these things. So uh, we, we know that they're happening. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we can see these, uh, this, uh, this call for the development of specific targets and timelines as building on our, um, our earlier ask for a, a national poverty reduction strategy. Thanks for that, Darlene. Uh, any other questions before we, um, before we move on to sort of the engaging with MPs part? Okay, I think we'll keep moving because we've got about 20 minutes left. And uh, again, please feel free to, to um, raise your hand or, or put your questions in the chat. And I will share my screen again. Is this me or you, Emily? I think it's me. Okay, so basically, we want to make sure when we're engaging with MPs that we're we're keeping in mind, you know, why are we bothering? What what are the goals for meeting and engaging with MPs? So um, at the very least, we want to ensure that our MPs know what matters to their constituents and how it affects them. What's going on in their communities that um, that can really um, stress the the importance of these issues and the urgency of these issues. Um, and we want to demonstrate that there is in fact sufficient public will to support them stepping out and showing the political will to take on these very ambitious targets. So we recognize again that these, we're asking for a lot of things in a shorter timeline um, with this pledge, but we're doing that because things have been left for so long without sufficient action or investment. And we know again that addressing these things now saves lives, uh, it saves money, <laughs> which sounds a bit garish to say, but, uh, but it is true. And so, um, you know, these are, these are life or death situations, frankly. And so we want to make sure that we are addressing things at the root of, of inequity and, um, and making sure that we're seeing measurable impact and, and equitable impact. So they're big asks and that requires a lot of political will to get these things done. It would take a huge amount of political will to meet some of these targets, particularly by 2025, you know, with, within, um, within four years. But again, as we said at the beginning, we think that these are absolutely attainable if there were sufficient political will. Um, but we know that politicians generally are waiting to see that there's sufficient public will to carry them through. So they may not be willing to go out on a limb. Um, some of them may, some, some of them may not be me willing to do that, um, even if they personally support these ideas. And so we have to show them that there is sufficient public will, that these are, um, these are targets that their constituents care about and are demanding to see action on, that we won't be satisfied with half measures and, and pretty words. And so there's this element of accountability that we're keeping them accountable for what they're, what they have pledged to do, um, that we're keeping them accountable in terms of what needs to happen and in terms of our, our human rights obligations as has been um, 
you know, consistent throughout, um, throughout other Chuanis campaigns and, and the work of dignity for all. And then, um, you know, lastly, we, we want to have an opportunity to fill in knowledge gaps. So, you know, a lot of MPs, um, I think, go into this uh, work with this genuine uh, desire to do what they think is best for their communities and, and the people they represent. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're coming in with a background on any of these issues. And so there are knowledge gaps to fill, there's, um, there's gaps in their expertise. And so we want to build these relationships to increase our access and our influence so that um, they're willing to hear, um, to, to take that information from us. Um, and, um, you know, think about things that, in a different way maybe, or um, you know, maybe they have some good ideas about what they'd like to do, but they, um, they might be misinformed about how to go about doing that. So uh, these meetings are an opportunity to, to address those gaps in knowledge and to um, build these relationships. So um, we're gonna go over a few suggestions for different parties in terms of the angles that you might wanna take. I know many of you on this call are very like seasoned veterans in, in meeting with MPs. So a lot of this is, is maybe, um, you know, old hat to you, um, but uh, we are recording this to be an ongoing resource. So uh, we're gonna go over a few tips that, that we've thought of. And um, again, feel free to, to share your questions or, uh, or comments in the chat. Okay, so um, I will go through uh, each party, uh, starting with the Liberals as they're currently in power. So I think our main message really is go further and go faster. Um, so the Liberal government has, you know, implemented this poverty reduction strategy, the first national housing strategy. They've definitely made some progress in these areas of poverty profile progress, but, you know, they've lost their majority government and a huge reason why is because they have under delivered on a lot of their promises. Um, there are a lot of communities, uh, our equity seeking communities that we keep drawing attention to have been underserved and especially um, th they've lost a lot of trust with the indigenous Métis and Inuit communities because of under delivery. So when you're meeting with your liberal MPs, you know, there's a lot of common ground to, to, to start off on. There's a lot of common goals. However, we you can emphasize on the need for timelines to be in the in the closer future, so that people's lives are and, and needs are being addressed faster. The need for more more um, robust work, more disaggregated data to understand how each community is being impacted, and the need for more transparency to ensure that equity seeking groups are, are being met as equally and proportionally to um, white heterosexual cisnormative Canadians. Um, the Conservative Party, now they've come out with a platform that's a lot more progressive than it has been in previous years and this is great steps there's some good common ground to start off with the conservative party MPs as well um, however um, definitely again they can always go further you can always um, emphasize certain policies policies that they have for example uh, they have put a lot of focus on unions and working poor and that is great but what kinds of populations are going to be served by these um, job policies will it serve you know just the people who are slightly above the above the poverty line or will it be you know um, servicing marginalized communities those furthest behind from uh, reaching, you know, um, a dignified and uh, sustainable um, lifestyle and income. Um, Natalie, I'm not sure if you wanted to bring anything up for the Conservatives. Um, did I miss before I go on to the other parties? Uh, I think maybe we could just, you know, we can recognize that um, yeah, some some parties are going to be more likely than others to support these asks, mm -hmm. but there's always an opportunity to um, to push for um, for further discussion with their caucus um, and um, to think about how again um, in terms of sort of this focus on small government that um, having strong national standards and strong federal investments can still um, still create space for um, locally developed solutions. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, we can, we can challenge some of the, or um, maybe not challenge, let's say build on some of the rhetoric um, in terms of this more moderate um, 
platform that uh, that Aaron O'Toole put out. Um, and again, just addressing knowledge gaps, appealing to the to the fact that uh, again, generally people are in this work because they believe that they're doing what they think is right for others. Um, mm -hmm. But I hear um, uh, someone I, I Carrie had shared, um, you know, some some fairly traumatic experiences in the past with MPs, and um, I don't I don't want to make assumptions about which party that was, but um, in terms of um, you know, meeting with someone that you think that maybe out the gate might uh, might disagree <laughs> pretty strongly with what we're trying to do here. I think there are still uh, it's still a worthwhile conversation to, in terms of that accountability piece, in terms of finding some points of of common ground. If um, you know, if if it's a collegial conversation, and um, you know, I, I think that change does come uh, incrementally, uh, which is, uh, you know, good, definitely not good enough, but, uh, you know, a few years ago, I don't think we would have expected that um, every political party would have been talking about climate change, for example, in their platform. So, so change does come through, through again, this uh, demonstration of, of public will where, um, you know, it, it no longer uh, will do for them to be silent on an issue. And so we can press them on, um, again, sort of the data about who's disproportionately impacted by poverty um, and um, and trying to build some some goodwill and some uh, some progress there. Thank you, Natalie. Um, okay, so NDP and NDP MPs, it's a lot of letters. Um, so this is the party that, you know, we we share the most common ground with, but that being said, there is still room for improvement. And, um, you know, the NDP have a lot of great policies and they've made some great strides towards, uh, you know, commitments towards poverty eradication, and as well as bringing in the discussion of equity. That being said, it, they, there are still not a lot of targets and timelines on exactly how these equity, equi excuse me, equity seeking groups are going to be served uh, by their policies. So you can always um, emphasize these points if they are, um, if you find that the conversation is not being critical enough, uh, you know, you can encourage your MP to use their seat to vote on truly effective and sustainable poverty policies um, and encourage them to push their platforms even further. Um, you know, just because they are one of the more progressive um, parties does not mean that they have necessarily addressed everything in the way that it needs to be addressed. Uh, so the green and block, um, because just given our uh, knowledge of our or, um, organizers, because the green MP, there's only two green MPs, and because not many of our organizers are in Quebec or um, in block writings, I will just very quickly breeze by. Um, but for greens, you can focus on, you know, a transition to uh, a just economy. Um, must prioritize poverty eradication and we must prioritize exactly who will be uh, addressed and block MPs, you know, you can focus on greater equity in the block uh, platform, you know, focus on going further and then focus on how, uh, you know, we're all in this together and in by engaging in, in federal discussions, uh, they can increase provincial funding for not only Quebec, but all of Canada. So it's a good way to work with the other provinces to um, better uh, better funding for Quebec as a province as well. Okay, I will. we will leave it at that and we'll have more resources uh, available to organizers soon uh, where we sort of hash out every party a little bit more detail, but I'll pass it off to Natalie just to sort of conclude with um, major speaking points for all parties. Thanks, Emily. Um, and again, I should stress that um, Dignity for All is a nonpartisan campaign. So while we might see more overlap with some platforms than others, um, we we're not endorsing any particular party, and um, we we want to work with all parties um, towards these shared goals. And so um, I'm I'm going to share a few um, a few points that might be common objections that we hear in MP meetings, <laughs> and how we might address them uh, regardless of of which party it is. Um, so one of the things that we commonly hear is like, okay, great, but how will we pay for all these things? So again, we haven't really named this in our in our pledge, um, but uh, you know some of the talking points that that you can go to, for example, are things like a wealth tax, uh, closing corporate tax loopholes, um, 
ending fossil fuel subsidies would save us $16 billion. And, and, um, and also the argument that dealing with these issues um, in a preventative way, um, it provides a huge cost savings in the long run when you're looking at healthcare spending, um, when you're looking at the criminal justice system, for example. So um, it is actually more financially, fiscally responsible to make investments in ending poverty and, and ending inequity um, in the long run. Um, another common uh, question or phrase I hear is, uh, you know, that's, that's great, but you know, what about, and then insert other pressing issues here. So whether that's climate change, whether that's, um, you know, uh, international access to vaccines, you know, whatever it is, like, absolutely, there, there are other pressing issues. They're not mutually exclusive, though, and actually um, taking bold and ambitious action on poverty and inequity in Canada can be done and, and must be done, really, in um, at the same time as looking at our international obligations, whether you're looking, whether that has to do with uh, climate, whether that has to do with, uh, you know, access to the vaccine or other medicines, for example, whether that has to do with migration policies. Um, so, you know, I think this is a bit of a, 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 a straw man argument in terms of, you know, like we, we, well, we can't do it all. We can't pay for, uh, for all these things at the same time. But in fact, if we don't tackle them all at the same time, it's going to cost more money. It's not going to be as effective, and we won't get to um, we won't get to our goal as quickly as if we take a holistic approach. So, um, I would say, in particular, uh, given the amount of, uh, of attention that is uh, rightfully being given to climate change right now as um, as a, a major crisis of our time. Um, Again, a, a just transition to a green economy means ensuring that this new economy, which is um, decarbonized, is benefiting all people. So that it's not perpetuating the inequities of our current economic systems, but it's actually creating a new economy that that actually benefits all people. And so I think you know we can make uh, we can easily make a case that these are all consistent with climate action and and with what's being called for by uh, socioeconomic and uh, environmental and climate activists, Indigenous activists, in terms of what we need to do to both uh, care for creation and, and care for the climate, but care for one another as well. Uh, and then lastly, um, I have already heard this myself, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of these goals, but, you know, I just don't think it's realistic that we'll get there by 2025, for example, or by 2030. Um, so to this, I would say, you know, again, mentioned this before, but um, we we firmly believe that it it would be absolutely possible to um, to lift people up to a certain income floor within four years because again we've we saw how we could do that so quickly with SERP. So a lack of political will shouldn't be an excuse to not sign the pledge and work towards these goals because these targets are attainable if there were sufficient public will, or sorry, if there were sufficient political will. Um, and um, uh, someone asked earlier in terms of kind of what constitutes sufficient public will. Um, and I'm sure that varies depending on, on the person and, and the party, but uh, generally, you know, it, it means that they feel like if they went out of a limb for this, it's not gonna cost them their seat in the next election. <laughs> So, um, you know, we want to think about making sure that uh, that these are issues that we are demanding action on and that um, are going to lose them votes if, if they don't do that. And um, and and also just, you know, in terms of their their credibility and their integrity that we want to show that, um, you know, these these are concerns that uh, are shared by the public and that um, Again, we, we won't be satisfied with, with half measures or dragging our feet or letting partisan politics get in the way of actually achieving these goals. So I'm sure there are nicer ways that you could say that, but that's the gist of it, that um, you know, the, these, things, these targets are attainable if there were sufficient political will to get them done. And, and we saw that with, with the pandemic and, and with some pretty, um, pretty ambitious measures in that regard, even though there was certainly room for improvement there as well. Um, so if you have met with your MPs and um, they agree to sign the pledge, 
then that's wonderful. Um, please still ask them to discuss this further with their caucus. Uh, ask for a photo and share it with us on social media or by email. Um, we'll be posting them on our, on our website. Um, please invite them to the virtual town hall, which is on October 20th, and hope, hopefully we'll see you all there as well. And um, tell them that you're planning to follow up with them. Um, I've put here, you know, post budget as an example, um, but, you know, let them know that this is not a, like a one time thing um, and uh, that you'll be following up with them. If they are looking for more information on any of these pledge points, we're happy to provide it. Um, and again, we'll be um, putting together some uh, some talking points that uh, that you can download and use. Um, and then if you know if you've had a, a meeting and, and they they decline to sign the pledge, we can still ask them to discuss it with their caucus because you know some there's different reasons why they might uh, decline to sign the pledge. Um, maybe they don't think it's consistent with their party line. Maybe um, you know they personally disagree with some of the targets. But um, please ask them to discuss it with their caucus um, and um, express that again these these targets are ambitious because they were, they we are trying to reflect the urgency of, of the situation and. Um, and the, and the disproportionate way that poverty does impact certain groups. Uh, you can offer to share more information if there are any, if they have particular objections to any points in the pledge. Um, if, uh, if you need help finding any information, we're happy to help with that. And please invite them to attend the virtual town hall as well, because that's just another opportunity for them to, uh, to hear from others. And, um, and even just to, you know, whether if they are a member of the uh, governing party or a member of the opposition, um, they all have a role in ensuring that there's accountability in our government and uh, making sure that uh, the government decisions are informed by, um, by the issues that their constituents care about. Um, so again, we're, we're asking folks to meet with their MPs um, I think, I believe initially we said, you know, from October 17th to the end of the month, but, you know, you can start earlier if you want to. And um, we have a couple senators who have signed the pledge so far, but I'm hoping that those numbers will start to jump up um, once we, uh, once these meetings get started. So um, thank you so much for your engagement and your continued support. I know um, many of you have been uh, organizing for two on this for years and uh, we couldn't do this without you and uh, we appreciate all your input um, so please keep in touch if you have any questions again we'll be sharing this recording and um, and more resources on our website um, and um, last thing we'll note is that there are resources as well for engaging your local media so uh, you can find under the engaging your local community page a sample press release sample letter to the editor and sample tweets and graphics under the um, Engage Your Social Networks page. So again, just some ideas there of ways that you can help spread the word. They uh, are downloadable in Word documents so you can customize them and, uh, but they'll provide some, some of our key talking points that we've gone over today and, and, uh, and our key framing. So I just want to uh, thank everyone for being here. Um, and uh, yes, we will share the PowerPoint as well. So we'll, we'll post the slides under, um, under the section of resources for organizers on our website as well. And uh, I'm sure we'll put links on social media and everything like that. So thanks again for being here. Um, happy to, to see everyone. And uh, Emily, I'll let you give your farewell as well. Thank you, everyone. I, I'm just I've been trying to respond to some of you directly. So I apologize if um, if you <laughs> if I haven't responded to your question in the chat, you can email us at the dignity for all email or reach out to one of us through our personal email accounts. I'm sorry, I'm not I think it, there's a few questions I missed. But, um, you know, in solidarity, we will, uh, we will work together. I'm very excited to kick off the launch this year. Oh, and I do see one more question just oh. about what, what our next steps will be after October. Um, so in terms of uh, what we'll do with the signed pledge, uh, we do have a list on our website that you can, a, a table that, um, it, that everyone will be able to see who has signed the pledge. And um, towards the end of the month, we'll start putting a bit more social media pressure on different, uh, on different MPs and senators, you know, um, publicly asking them to sign the pledge. 
And, um, and so we'll continue to, uh, to have follow up meetings. Um, and um, particularly, you know, as we're looking at how uh, cabinet takes shape and uh, what the budget looks like, uh, this is kind of just a springboard for further meetings. So again, um, even even for you folks as local organizers, um, you know, the pledge is meant to kind of get these conversations going and then hopefully at least to further conversations about how we actually achieve these targets, right? And how, um, how does meaningful consultation happen so mm -hmm. that we can develop these uh, locally developed and locally meaningful solutions? So they'll there will be um, other further opportunities for engagement, um, but we will be uh, sharing publicly who has signed the pledge and, uh, and calling for others to do so, and then following up uh, with, with further meetings. Um, but again, open always to your ideas of ways to, to stay engaged. Uh, we've had to get creative these past this year and, and last year in terms of shifting to a digital um, digital strategies and, and um, you know, shifting away from our typical postcard campaign. Um, but yes, this is always meant to be kind of one more, um, one more stage in, in an ongoing conversation uh, where again, hopefully, you know, as, as folks sign on to this pledge, then we can look for opportunities to connect them with, uh, with groups that have been researching the, the pathways to achieve these targets and, and goals and hopefully meeting with parliamentary committees, um, all, all the government relations work that, that must continue to, uh, to find opportunities, whether that's gonna look like legislation or budget submissions or what have you. But um, again, this is one piece of the puzzle. So thanks to each of you for, for your part in this. And um, again, it's so critical just to show that that public will is there. So thank you again so much for being with us today. And, uh, and for your engagement. And uh, please do keep in touch and uh, share your questions and input and suggestions with us. Thanks everyone.